got quiet in here tonight. <laughs> but thou will know, O oh man, that faith without works is dead. Verse 20. Listen to what he says about Abraham. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect or complete. Let me tell you something. Abraham, that would have been tough now. I want you to think about what happened to Abraham. Abraham left his country. He left his family. He left the country of his birth. Went out there and God made him a promise. He said, Abraham, I'll always be with you. Leave your country, I'll always be with you. And he got up there and he looked at the stars of the heaven and God made him a promise. He said, I'll make thy seed as the stars of heaven. God made Abraham a promise and yet he didn't have no children. God also made Abraham a promise that his covenant would be established by his seed. In other words, through his lineage, through his the, the, the fruit of his loins. God made that promise. God made a promise that there would be a, a Savior, a, a sacrifice, the one that would take away the, the sins of Israel. God made that promise to Abraham, and Abraham believed it. Abraham said, yeah, God, I'll leave my country. God believed He believed God. He had faith in God. Listen, and God counted it to him as righteousness. God imputed to Abraham righteousness. One might say that Abraham was saved pre-Calvary. Because he put his faith in God's promise of what God would do. Listen, people in the Old Testament were saved no different than they are in the New Testament. The people who were saved in the Old Testament looked forward to the day that God would send His Messiah, His Son Jesus Christ. They by faith went to that tabernacle and that temple and they offered up those sacrifices. Yet the Bible says that the blood of bulls and goats could not take away sin, but yet they offered those sacrifices in good faith, believing that they represented the one that God would send His Son to die for the sins of the people. People in the New Testament era are saved no differently except they look back not prophetically forward, but they look back historically to what Christ did on the cross of Calvary. We look to that. You and I look to that and say, right there is where I was saved. Right there is where my sins were washed away. Right there is where I was justified. Right there is where I was sanctified. Right there is where I was made holy. That is, that is faith in the historical historical fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary for nine of your sins. Amen. We have faith in that. We are saved no difference. A couple of different things though. The person who was saved in the Old Testament whenever they died because Calvary hadn't taken place yet, they couldn't go into the presence of God, but they were taken into a, a place called paradise. This is how come Jesus told him that thief. He said, today you will be with me in paradise. And you go on, you read in Scripture, you find out that Jesus went into paradise and He preached to those and He opened up paradise and He let them out. Yes. And the Bible says now to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Because of Calvary, now when you and I pass away, when this body goes away, we go into the presence of of Jesus Christ. We're not held in limbo in some in place because the sin debt had not been paid. How many of you have ever heard that old expression, that'll be the devil to pay for that? Yeah. Well, let me tell you something. The devil doesn't get paid anything. That sin debt that was paid was owed to God. Mm -hmm. And God Himself furnished a sacrifice for you and I and paid Himself. The Bible says that by when, when He couldn't swear by no greater, he swore by Himself. In other words, he, he made a covenant with you and I, but He Himself is the surety for that covenant. He Himself guaranteed that that covenant was true and it was going to take place in mine and your life. You and I can have faith in that. Abraham, even though this seed was promised to him, this child, and he was, he was childless and so was Sarah. They, they didn't have a child in and you know the story of the Bible. In a nutshell, Sarah and Abraham tried to make the will of God happen. And he was taking the bondwoman and got her pregnant and had a child of her and Ishmael. And he had to deal with that 
Ishmael aspect the rest of his life because he got in the flesh. He tried to make the promises of God come about and it didn't work. But 25 years later, Sarah conceived and the, the child of promise, Isaac, came along and what a joyous time it was that there was the child of promise. But then one day, God tells Abraham, He says, take your son and go and sacrifice him in this mountain. Can you imagine the Bible says that Abraham was three days' journey into that mountain to sacrifice him. You know, Isaac looked around and he says, Father, I see the wood and I see the fire, but where is the sacrifice? Isaac didn't realize he was the sacrifice. Can you imagine the faith that Abraham had to have in God to march for three days into the mountains knowing that he was about to sacrifice his son? But you know, Abraham expressed faith. He said, listen, me and the boy are going to go worship and we'll be back. And yet he didn't have the sacrifice. Because Isaac was the sacrifice. But somehow through faith, Abraham knew that even if he killed Isaac on the mountain in obedience to God, that God had the ability to resurrect him. He, he by faith knew that he was coming back with his son. He believed the promise that God had gave him. Abraham expressed works in his life. And the Bible says that his, his works here, listen, I'll read this again. He says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? Or complete. Now I tell you, that ought to tell you and I something about people that we see that are saved or, or, or claim salvation, the kind of life that they live. Have you ever thought about that? That right there ought to, ought to, ought to shine a, a big light on our view of, of people who claim to have faith in Christ but yet their life does not reflect the life of Christ. Now I understand that there's people that, are, that have gotten saved and they're going to make mistakes and there's going to be failures. All of us have, have fell out at one time or another. We've all failed God. But the thing about it is, is if you really truly have been born again, you can't go out in sin without it tearing something on the inside of you all to pieces. You may not express it outwardly so much, but inside you're dying. If, if you express faith in Christ and what He did on the cross, but, but yet you, you walk away with that and you allude into the things of the world and you, you do what the world does and there's no convicting power that stops you to, to bring you to repentance. There's, there's something wrong somewhere in the experience that you have in the Lord. Because yet you say you have faith, but there's no works that confirm. There's no works that bring it complete. There's no, I must not, I'm just not saying this good enough tonight. There's nothing that brings about the proof of the fruit that Christ has done something in your life. Listen, this thing hinges on, on our, our belief. It, it hinges on, on our faith, our walk with Him. God doesn't quit His covenant. God doesn't leave you and I. Just because I go out and mess up once in a while, He doesn't somehow or another back up and say, hey, I can't have anything to do with Bruce anymore. But Paul said himself, the just shall live by faith. By faith you're saved. Not of works. Lest any man should boast. It is by grace. It is by faith. It is by mind your belief. What about, what about people who, who have been saved? Who once walked with God? But yet they, they turn their back on God and they walk away from Him. Never to serve Him anymore. 
Now, the Lord's full of grace and He's good. But I'm going to tell you something. A man or a woman can walk away from God. That's serious as a heart attack. They can do it. And the thing about it is, if you walk far enough to where your heart becomes seared. Anybody know what seared is? It's almost like it's got a seared scab over the top of it. That's why we sear a steak so we can keep the flavor inside the meat and it doesn't leak out. Nothing can get in it. Nothing can get out of it. And the Bible says that our conscience can become seared on the inside. We can, we can reject God enough. We can walk away from we can We can not listen to the wooing and the, the calling of the Holy Spirit until till we get to a place to where we're, we're seared on the inside and nothing affects us anymore. God speaks and we don't listen. You know, you know I'm going to tell you, I've known people who one time walked with God, who walked away from God, and they became bitter in their soul, and they died in that bitterness. They died in that not believing in Christ. That, that bitterness of, of, of not, not having any love in their life. People, listen, I'm going to tell you something. You and I are saved by faith, but it is a continual faith. You can't count on a historical day way back then. Come on now. You've got to have a living faith. This ain't a one-time faith. This is a, a faith that lives every single day. True. Every single day I wake up. And, and you know, I've told you, I've said, out, Lord, the one you love is awake. But every single day I have to purposely put it in my heart that I'm going to walk with Him. That I'm going to follow Him. I have to purposely put it in my heart that I'm going to produce some type of works in my life. I'm going to let the, the Lord do something in my life that proves my faith. Yeah. We've got people out here living today that claim to have faith that there's no proof. As someone would say, the proof is in the pudding. Well, hey, there's no proof in the pudding. Because if a person says they're saved, there's going to be some type of work in their life that is manifest for the world to see. He said, you're the light of the world. In other words, when you and I get saved, we become the reflection of Jesus Christ. We become the light in this darkened world. But yet I know people who in the church, I know people who have claimed salvation, I know people who, who claim to be saved that would just as soon lie and steal and cheat and rob you, and they live in darkness. My question to you is, are those people still in the faith? Are those people still living by faith? Are the people still following after Christ? I'm not going to sit here and say whether or not they're, they're saved or they're lost. But are those people, are they still sensitive to the moving of the Holy Spirit? How many people have I seen? It? And Lord, I've run across this. I've run across people that were so steeped in their sin, they were, they were bitter and arrogant and unteachable, and you could not talk to them. Because they were right. They were rebellious. They had the, the spirit of witchcraft all over them. You go into the homosexual community, and I'm not saying that, that every gay guy and every lesbian that there is is, is a bad person. I believe there's people that are, that are good people that are caught up in sin, and they need to realize that God has something so much better for them than anything this world has to offer but I've run into people that was literally uh, repulsive and arrogant and, and unteachable and, and, and wicked and would not listen. And, and they were already on the defense. They were, they were already defensive to you. And you couldn't, you couldn't reach them because there was no openness in their heart. There was no works in their heart that was, that was there. They were, they were seared on the inside. And you couldn't talk to them. They instantly drew a line in the sand and said, here's the battle line. I'm going to fight you. I know, I know children that are like that. I know children that have made up their mind about their parents. They've made up their mind about authority in their life. And really that's what it is in a child of God's life is you can be saved, 
But if you reject the authority of the Holy Spirit operating in your life to, to take you through those trials, take you through those temptations, take you through those troubles, and you become unteachable and you quit listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit who is trying to work inside of your life. Listen, you will drift further and further and further and further away till you won't be able to hear the voice of God like you one time was. You know, it's kind of like sitting and watching some mindless something on television. We have become so desensitized by what we watch on TV. Do you realize how many murders that we witness a year? Now, I know it's not real murders, but we have become so desensitized about what we watch. Yes, Christians. We watch murder on TV. And we think nothing really about it. Matter of fact, we get a kick out of it sometimes watching detective shows. Murder, She Wrote. I hated that show. I never liked it. I don't even like that lady at play. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> never, never cared for it. Now I liked Matt Lock because he was he was kind of he was kind of arrogant, fleshly. Yeah. He'd get on one of his temper tantrums once in a while, and I think we could all relate to that. I like the Rockford Files growing up because Jim always got his trailer blowed up and his car stole, and he got beat up in every episode. So there was comedy and all that. It was it was it was fun. It was something to watch. And, and I tell people all the time, why do you want to watch junk and just pumps tragedy into your house? There's enough tragedy in this world. Yeah. That's why I don't watch the news. I hate the news. I despise the news. I will go ahead and prophesy to you tonight. If you get home by 11 o'clock, turn on the news. I prophesy that in Atlanta, there's a stabbing going on right now. There's a raping going on right now. Somewhere down there, there's an apartment on fire right now. There always is. Just, just bad news. But yet we we're, we we sit and we watch this stuff just to be entertained, just to be entertained. And at the same time as we watch this stuff, it desensitizes us to the things of the Lord. It really does. Mm -hmm. We don't think much about a shoot unless it happens to in our area, in our arena. When it happens to somebody close to us, then it hits home. Our children. Our children, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know what that's like. Go through losing a child to somebody being shot and killed. It 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 brings it home to us and suddenly we wake up and we realize how evil this world is. And yet we find ourselves drawn to sitting and numb be made numb by what we watch and what we listen to. And it, it hurts us on the inside. It hurts our faith. It hurts the, the works that is produced in us. It hurts the fruit that is produced in us. I'm not telling you to go home and burn your, throw your TV in the garbage. Although as my old pastor used to say, you'd probably be better off if you did. You might start eating together and talking to one another again. Amen? I'll never forget, Lois and I first got married. I brought my TV from Mom and Daddy's with me. I had a 12 inch black and white. You had to stick a toothpick in the volume knob to get the volume to stay on. If you took the toothpick out, it'd go quiet. So it had a toothpick wedged in it. I'll never forget, we had this eagle cook stove that I had dug out of the ground down there at the house. And I painted it all black, put it in the living room, and I had set that TV on it. Well, man, we watched that TV, I know, for years. And I've watched it for years at home at Mom and Daddy's. And I'll never forget somebody coming into the house one day. And they sat on the couch. And they said, is your TV tore up? I said, what do you mean? I said, well, you got that little bitty black and white one sitting there. Uh, is your TV tore up? I said, no, man, that's it. <laughs> That's it. That's our TV right there. I think they felt sorry for us. Because we didn't put so much care and emphasis on having to have a, a big television to watch. 
Lord, now we go out and buy one that's 20 feet long and 8 feet high and got surround sound all through the house. And, and, and you know how it is. You get that you got that genie now with Greg where you can record five programs or eight programs at a time. And God knows you don't want to miss anything. <laughs> got to watch American Idol. And, you know, all that. All that stuff. Education. <laughs> Education. 